everyone. Welcome to First Christian Church Online. We're so glad that you're here today. My name is Jordan, and I would love to connect with you. I um, want to encourage you today, as you're watching the service, to take a moment and reply to a chat. Say hey to somebody in there. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Um, also, you can always hop on over to scottsburg.church. That's our website. And on there, there's an online connect card. Uh, and I personally would love to connect with you this week if you fill that out and let us know how we can walk with you. Um, like I said, great things today. It's going to be a great service. Thanks for being back with us. We're glad that you're here. Let's take a few moments here and worship God. Born of 
Welcome to First Christian Church Online. I'm Lead Pastor Matthew Craig, and I just am excited about being with you today. Uh, we're starting a new series called Kingdom Living, and um, and it's going to be over the next four or five weeks, six weeks, and um, just a great opportunity to share together. Um, as one friend of mine put it, um, we're trying to live on earth with heavenly thinking, and uh, it's, it's going to be fun. So uh, stick here with us. Get your Bibles open. Um, today we're going to be in mainly Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> and so do that. Um, but before we get there, <clears throat> I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> excuse me. About Hugh Halter. Uh, Hugh Halter wrote a book several years ago about the tangible kingdom. And he shares a story of his time after 9-11. He was in New York after 9-11 in Queens, New York, matter of fact, and he was training church planners. And every night after their training, they would walk down to this local Irish pub. And a waitress waited on them every night. Her name was Fiona. And um, Hugh says that she served us well, but she always seemed curious about our faith and what we were teaching pastors and this idea of planting churches. And so each evening, he said, our conversation just deepened. Until one night, she asked this, so why are you helping pastors lead churches if churches really don't do much good? Well, what could I say? Hugh said. And he said, I began to think about how could I explain my love for Jesus without bringing the church in it? So I simply just talked about the kingdom. Fiona 
was amazed. And I said, he was telling the story, and he said, I, I told her, Jesus came to offer an alternative way of life for all the exclusive, religious, sectarian, and sinful ways people live. Jesus called it the kingdom. It was huge for people back in Jesus' day, and it's still huge for anyone looking for a real relationship with God. She said, I never thought about the kingdom. I've never heard of the kingdom. Tell me more. Hugh says in his book, that night changed the way I think <clears throat> about church. My final night in town, he writes, I came to say goodbye before flying back to Oregon. I heard Fiona yell over a crowded room, that's the guy I was telling you about. You've got to hear how he talks about God. And as the bar room split, she called all of her friends over. And she looked at me and she said, tell them what you told me. You know Tell them all about that kingdom stuff. That night changed my life, he writes. I started an entirely new spiritual journey that pulled me out of my jaded, consumeristic Christianity. But what would I do next? I simply grabbed a few friends and started a community that was committed to living out and inviting others into kingdom ways of thinking. If you've been around FCC any time, for the last few years, you've heard me talk about <clears throat> my heart, um, our mission, helping people find their way back to God. You've heard me talk about helping people grow in their relationship with Jesus. Um, we started this year off talking about our home plate and, and how we want to help people get across home plate. Talked about our core values. But what really I haven't talked about is where all of that's come from in my heart. What I've learned through church planning, what I've learned through a small church in Ohio, what I've learned over the last 20 plus years of doing ministry and, and honing in on how can I live in this world, dealing with church and culture and how do we balance out the two? What, what does Jesus want us to do? And at least for me, in my own mind, in my own head, in my own heart, I've come to a pretty good place, a pretty confident place. And I'm pretty confident that what I'm going to share with you over the next six weeks is, is what Jesus wants from us. He, he wants us to truly be committed to living out kingdom values. He wants you and I to invite people into kingdom living. You see, following Jesus is, is not just about the day you say yes to Jesus, being baptized. All of those are, are needed. They're the first step. What follows is your commitment, my commitment to growing and living kingdom values in this world. See, I noticed a long time ago, Jesus never invited anyone to church. Now, part of that is because the church wasn't around, right? But Jesus didn't invite anybody to church. Jesus didn't ask them to come to church. Jesus simply asked the people, his disciples, and those gathered there in that early, early moments of his ministry, to simply follow him. He, he invited them into the kingdom. Matthew chapter 3. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's, that's straight from John the Baptist, right? Jesus then said, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus himself began to preach this message of turning back to God, following him, because the heaven of kingdom or the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news about the kingdom. Matthew 5, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Matthew 5:10, 
God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Matthew 5, 19, Matthew 5, 20, on and on and on. Jesus continues to talk about the kingdom of heaven. Most of Jesus' parables are preparing us um, for the kingdom. He doesn't necessarily talk about um, his death on the cross. He, he does lean to that. He does shadow that. But most of his parables are preparing for his return. And we just spent 17 weeks talking about it. The kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus simply, if, if I could put it in Matt Craig terms, Jesus points us to live out the kingdom of heaven here now on earth. He says in Matthew 6, chapter 10. Now write this one down. Read it over and over. Think about it. He says, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's talking to the Father. It's part of his prayer. Matthew 6, 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. He doesn't say, do all of these church things, do all this religious stuff. He simply is talking about attitude, heart, mind. Live in such a way that you seek the kingdom of God above everything else. Matthew 7, 13. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and the gate is wide for many who choose that way. You can only enter through the God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. He didn't say enter into Jesus or into me. He's talking about God's kingdom. Why all this kingdom talk if the kingdom of heaven wasn't something that we were supposed to be focused on? He says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. And there's the rub for me. There's the aha moment. Not everyone who calls to me, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. And then I started thinking about will. And then I started down this path of what's God's will? Because you always hear somebody talking about the will of God. Well, what we're going to unpack today somewhat is this idea of will and what exactly it is. And so let's be clear. I absolutely believe that you need to follow Jesus for all of you, you know, you need to follow Jesus. You need to be baptized. You need to be in a church. You need to be with a group of people, um, a gathering of people, whether it's in a house or a church building or, or wherever it may be. It's without a shadow of a doubt that's, that's important, and that's first things first. But we need to learn how to live with kingdom thoughts and kingdom values. Dallas Willard in one of his books suggests when we put our trust in Jesus, we're opening up a new life of kingdom living. Basically, he suggests that we're beginning a new life transformed and changed by Jesus so that we can be the type of people who live out kingdom characteristics, godly characteristics here on earth, and as he suggests, so that we can live out the power of God in our lives. What I hope to show you today is this. You must have harmony with God's character before you can live out God's power. I want you to listen to that again. You must live in harmony with God's character before you can live out God's power. You cannot live out God's power without first demonstrating God's character. Dallas Willard puts it this way. Living in the kingdom of God is walking in the character and power of God. You can't do one without the other. And you cannot have the latter without the former. N.T. Wright says, New life that has been implanted in Christians is to show itself in the form of energy, power, and strength to live in a new way. You see, what Paul is praying for for the Colossians 
<clears throat> is that this salvation that they have in Christ is displayed in their character so that God can then show them their, their power, that God can demonstrate his power through them. And the same power that is with Jesus, the same power that was with the disciples, is now with us, and we struggle to figure out, well, why don't I feel that way? Why is God's power not showing up in my life? Why, why am I struggling so much? Maybe it's because we're not living godly character. I'm not talking about right or wrong here, just right or wrong, doing the right thing or the wrong thing. I'm talking about godly character. When no one else is around, when everybody's around, what do we do? How do we act? How do we live? And so what I want to do with you today is, is just walk through some, some of this early part of Colossians so that we can begin to unpack this idea of kingdom living. So, are you ready? I hope so. If you're here today watching, man, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we would love for you to drop us a note. Um, we hope uh, you'll do that if you need a prayer. Um, there's some things that you can do right there and drop us a note. We'll be praying for you. Um, you can go to our website, scottsburg.church, find out some more information. But, but I, I want you to just take a moment here and get settled um, because we're going we're gonna to go through this, and it's, it's some good stuff, and I don't want you to miss it. All right? You ready? Cool. Here we go. Colossians chapter 1 Paul is with Timothy. They're in Ephesus. Paul and Timothy are in prison. Um, Epaphras is, is working with Paul and Timothy while in Ephesus. And, and Paul takes this moment to write to a new church, a church plant. It's in Colossae. It's the Colossian church. It's a sister church to Laodicea. And this new church has been was started by the spreading of the good news of Jesus. And the Colossians were doing a really pretty good job of, of getting things going. Paul, Paul or Timothy or none of the other apostles had ever been to Colossae. And so Paul says, hey, I want, I'm writing this letter so that I can encourage you. And he's really encouraging them to, to take on this kingdom mindset, this kingdom living. And he wants to give them some basics, some foundational information about how to live out godly characteristics. So if we jump down to verse 6, Colossians 1, it says, This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. Notice a couple of things. Number one, it's bearing fruit. We think of this fruit as new disciples, new converts, new Christians. And it very much is. But it's also bearing fruit in the lives of those who are listening to the gospel. So, yes, it's bringing new disciples in. But this fruit that is, that is being produced is also this daily life fruit. It says, by changing lives, just as it changed your life from the first day you heard it. Here's the cool thing. When you and I live out kingdom values, God gives us godly character or godly power so that we can produce godly fruit. Now, I know where your mind's going. For those of you who've been around church for any amount of time, those of you who read your Bible, you're going to go to the fruit of the Spirit, and we'll get there. But put a pin in it. Just keep in mind this idea of godly character. Godly power producing kingdom fruits. Or you could say kingdom character, kingdom power producing kingdom fruit. Colossians 7 and 8, look at this. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Here's another key. It says the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. This isn't just natural love. This isn't just the love that everyone has for 
for their family or for their friends. You don't have to follow Jesus to love people. No, that's a fact. But there is this Holy Spirit kind of love that is a product of godly character given to us through God's power, through the Holy Spirit. It's a different kind of love. It's a godly love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that says you're more important than I am. Now, that's not necessarily natural. But here, in what we're talking about, you need to understand that this kind of love that the Colossians have for other people came from the Holy Spirit. Okay? Tracking? Okay. It's kingdom love. It's a deeper kind of love. It's the kind of love that echoes the love of God. It, it mimics and follows the kind of love that Jesus had. It's not naturally known to everyone. Again, it's something given by the Holy Spirit as the Colossians, again, live out, verse 6, live out these kingdom values. Verse 9, so, it's a huge word, S-O, so, because of all of this that we've just talked about, verses 6, 7, and 8, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. Paul and Timothy understand what's going on. And they are praying a very specific prayer. And it says, Paul here says, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Here's the tricky part. This is the will part that I am trying to break down today for you. For a long time, I, I thought of the will of God as, okay, what's God want for my life? Like, what job does he want me to have? Where does he want me to live? Who does he want me to love? What kind of cars do he want me to drive? All this stuff, right? It would be like saying, okay, guys, listen, I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is um, God has called me to the Bahamas. The good news is I've accepted, right? The will of God wants me to preach in the Bahamas. Okay, understand, right? We think of the will of God as what do we need to do as a job? What's a relationship? What does God want or what does God have for me, right? That's not necessarily the will here. God's will also is what he wants for us, meaning how he wants us to live. Paul is praying for people to understand the fullness of God's character, God's will, how God moves, how God acts, how God treats people, how he sees people, how he loves people, how he disciplines. This is all part of God's will, meaning his character, not your plans. Basically, he wants people to know and understand what God desires. What does God desire for me? When I wake up in the morning, what does he want for me to do? What does he want me to do? Not, does he want me to go to McDonald's or Burger King? No, no, no. How does he want me to treat people? How does he want to see my enemy? How does he want me to love my neighbor? This is kingdom living. This is kingdom thought. This is heavenly thinking coming to earth. God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Remember what Jesus said. So look at verse 10. It says, Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. See the connection here? God's will connected to the way you live, not what you do, not what kind of house you live in, not what kind of job you have, but what kind of person are you? The way you live. And Paul says, your lives will produce every kind of, if you're following along in your Bible, good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Your lives will produce every kind of good fruit because of the way you live. Are you beginning to see here? Notice the structure. 
then. The way you live will always honor and please God. What you say, what you do, your character will match God's character. And because your character matches God's character, you will produce every kind of godly fruit. All the while growing, knowing God better and better. Paul's laid out the first part of kingdom living. And that is God's character. Now we need to move into God's power. Remember what Dallas Willard said. Living in the kingdom of God is walking in the character and power of God. So in verse 11, Paul is just laying it out here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. We also pray. So here's the second prayer, right? The first one is for characteristic character, the way you live. Now, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. Oh. Love. Um, and now joy. It's connected here. Is your mind going over to Galatians? The Holy Spirit? Okay, it should. We're getting there. But here, God's character is directly connected to God's power in your life. And if you want to have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, you want to have the fruit of the Spirit, as Galatians says, we need to keep in step with the Spirit. Literally, we need to be in step with God's character. When you're not in harmony with God's character, you cannot be in harmony with God's power. But the opposite is true, isn't it? When you and I are in harmony with God's character, we can live out God's power. And then, through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I, the more we walk with God and the more our lives echo God and look at his and, and mimic his and, and, and are like Jesus's, the more we will produce every kind of good fruit. Now, if we jump over to Colossians chapter 2, Paul begins another section. And he says, And now, just as you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. There's this idea that this isn't just a one-time thing. Godly character is like, oh yeah, I know what godly character is. It's all in my mind. No, no, no. We learn it, and then we live it. He says, let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. On who? Jesus. Our roots, our, our, our roots need to grow down deep into Jesus. That's our foundation. Our lives need to be built on Jesus. Then your faith will grow strong. The confidence in God will grow strong. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Notice another characteristic of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Now, Galatians chapter 5, the Holy, the fruit of the Spirit, it's, it's the one that you recognize, right? But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Meaning... We've taken our human characteristics, what we naturally want to do, and we've nailed them to the cross with Jesus. And because we've nailed them to the cross of Jesus, we have a new life in Jesus, so we take on new characteristics. And because we take on these new characteristics and we live them out, God gives us power to produce good fruit. Here's the question. You know why I'm so angry? You know why you're so angry? You know why I'm so anxious? You know why you're so anxious? It very well could be I'm not living out the character of God in my life like I should. That's not a judgment. This isn't about being right or wrong. This is about growth. 
Jesus doesn't expect us to get it right all the time. He expects us to grow. Paul says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You and I are going to have to follow the Spirit's leading. When I come to a crossroads and I want to choose judgment or compassion, which one will I choose? When I come to a crossroads and I want to choose being right or showing grace, which one will I choose? When I come to a crossroads and I'm, and I'm in a moment where I can gossip or hold my tongue, which one will I choose? When I can think the worst about the church or think the best about Jesus, which will I choose? See, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, since, because of, Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Heavenly thinking invading earthly reality. One of my friends tell me that all the time, and I just love it. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Does that mean that we can't have nice things? Absolutely not. But what are we going to do with those nice things? Am I going to be hospitable? Am I going to serve? Are are we going to allow the things of earth to dominate our time? See, Paul's not telling us to kick our feet back and just think about heaven and someday we'll get there. (laughs) That's obviously not what he's talking about because that's not what's going to happen. What Paul is explaining is a secret of living in the kingdom now producing good fruit now. Who doesn't want godly love and joy and peace and patience? Are we always going to have it? No. I mean, we're going to work for it. We're going to try to strive for it. And when those opportunities come to forgive and show compassion and to encourage and build up, to have self-control, Am I growing in those areas? You see, the more I grow in godly character, I firmly believe the more I will live out my life with God's power through the Holy Spirit, helping me, directing me. I'm not always going to get it right. But I will begin to grow more like Jesus. Randy Alcorn said, we tend to start with earth and reason up towards heaven when instead we should start with heaven and reason down toward earth. Remember Jesus' words? May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he will give you everything you need. I'm beginning to understand in my own life, and I have begun to understand and unpack this over the last 10 or 12 years especially. To live in the kingdom, I've got to have a kingdom mindset. It's not all about this church. It's not all about that church. It's not all about me. It's how am I following Jesus today? Am I loving my neighbor? The neighbor that absolutely hates me? the neighbor who I would call an enemy? How, how's God showing up in that relationship? The spouse who hurt me. The, the boss who fired me. The child who has run away and le- left Jesus behind. The loved ones that I lost. What character shows up in those moments? And over the next several weeks, we're going to unpack a lot of those things. But let me just kind of land the plane here. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, 
I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. For years, I've thought of this as health. I'm not healthy. I'm, obviously, I'm overweight. And I've struggled with that for a really long time. And this verse always kept slapping me in the face. Give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Matt, you need to be healthy. You need, yeah, I know I need to be healthy. That's not what this verse is telling me. There's a deeper connection here. And body isn't just health. Is health important? Absolutely. But Paul's not, Paul doesn't have in mind here, keep your body healthy. That's your spiritual act of worship. It's keep your body in check with God's character, meaning what you say, what you do with your hands, what you do with your feet, where you go, what you look at, what you listen to, everything about your body. Give your bodies what you put in your mouth, all of what your body is, mental and spiritual, emotional, all of these things, give it to God. Meaning, allow God's character to live out in your daily life so that you can live with God's power producing good fruit. You want to be more joyful? It starts with becoming more compassionate. You want to not be full of anxiety? It begins by trusting. I think it's clear. Paul is telling us Jesus should set the pace. Jesus is the standard. God sets the tone. Godly character is the doorway to living a godly life. And that is the true way to worship. We want to worship God. We want to love God. We want to follow Jesus. It begins with godly character. God's will for our life. The Bible teaches us here in Romans that there's a direct connection between our minds and our bodies. Transform your mind, and your body will follow. Transform the way you think, our actions will change. Our mindset will change. And when our mindset changes, our actions change. And when our actions change, our mindset changes. They're directly connected together. And the more we transform one and the other, the more we're transformed. And so the more we're able to worship God in a way that our life is good and pleasing. Because God's will for us, his will, to, to love your neighbor. How do we do that? How do we love each other? How do we find true joy? If we follow Romans chapter 12, verse 3 and 5, Paul begins to set the foundation for this transformational lifestyle. One, he says, don't think you're better than you really are. <laughs> you ain't all it, right? Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. You got to evaluate yourself. You got to check yourself. Am I living out godly character? Measure yourself by the faith God has given us. Measure yourself by God's standard. And just as your bodies have many parts, each part has a special function. So it is with Christ's body. When we are many parts of one body, we all belong to each other, meaning we all work together. We're all there for each other. That's kingdom living. That's the church. So, are you in tune with the Spirit? Are you in step? Does our church body look that way? Or does our church body look very worldly? Does your life look worldly? Are you acting and following the characteristics of this world? Gossip and slander, argumentative, divisive. Are, are those the things that are your characteristics? 
I don't know. Paul would say, be honest with yourself. Evaluate yourself. That's the first step. Does my life look like God's characteristics are playing themselves out? Am I living godly characteristics when I'm dealing with my friends and my family and my coworkers? And if I'm not, I can't expect God to give me his power. Because God will give his power to those who he knows will do the right thing when it's their choice. There was a, um, a, 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 a study done at some point. I, I don't know when it was done, but it, it took college students and it put them against kindergartners. Their job, it took 20 college students, uh, graduate level college students, and 20 kindergartners. And here's what they needed to do. They had to be, they had to build structures using 20 pieces of spaghetti, one yard of tape, one yard of string, and one marshmallow. The only rule, the marshmallow had to be on the top. So these students, these college level students, began by diagnosing the task, formulating a solution, assigning roles. Kindergartners, they just started working. They just started messing things up and doing it wrong and then trying again, failing and trying it again. And Daniel Coyle explains the outcome. We presumed we presumed the skilled college students would combine to produce skilled performance. And the assumption was wrong. In dozens of these trials, kindergartners built structures that averaged 26 inches tall, while the college students built structures that averaged less than 10 inches. He concluded, We see smart, experienced college students, and we find it difficult to imagine that they would combine to produce a poor performance. And we see unsophisticated, inexperienced, wild kindergartners. And we find it difficult to imagine that they could combine to produce success. Here's what he concluded. Individual skills are not what matters. What matters is the interaction. While the college students had all the experience, all the knowledge... They did not interact. They did not come together. They could not decide who was right or who was wrong. Kindergartners, they didn't care. Just want to make sure the marshmallow was on top. It doesn't matter what it looked like. It didn't matter what it sounded like. It didn't matter how they got there. The job was to create a tall structure with a marshmallow on top. Have fun. They messed up. Do it again. Kindergartners succeeded, not because they're smarter, because they work together. Doyle said they are tapping into a simple and powerful method in which a group of ordinary people can create a performance far beyond the sum of their parts. And A.W. Tozer said this, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other. They are not, they are of one accord by being tuned. Tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which all of them must follow. Kingdom living. Simply put, all of us who follow Jesus, keeping in step with the Spirit, living in tune with God's character, will 
produce good fruit. But all of us who follow Jesus, trying to be on top, doing our own thing, creating our own world, not being in step with the Spirit, will not be able to produce good fruit. So church, this isn't about right or wrong, evangelism, discipleship, all the churchy stuff. This is way before any of that can ever happen. This is the very beginning. And this is what Paul talks about. How do you and I live out godly character in such a way that God's power will work through us producing good fruit? Over the next five weeks, each week we're gonna unpack a little bit more of what it means to live in God's character and live on earth as it is in heaven. Thanks for being here today. God bless you guys. Be safe. Have a good week. We'll see you next time.